Okay, great. Uh, so, this is the conundrum of Admiral Zoha and Christopher Columbus. So, in 1405, Admiral Zhongha set sail from China with the greatest armada in history. He had 27,000 men in over 300 ships of all different classes, troops and horse transports, patrol boats, men of war, and even fresh water tankers for those men. And, and he went on seven long voyages over a period of 28 years. He went from China all the way down Southeast Asia all the way to India, to Arabia, even up to Mecca, and even all the way to Equatorial Africa. So, in that same century, in 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail from Spain with 90 men in three threadbare boats, and in fact, one of them, the rudder, broke after three days at sea. And just to give you a sense, this is a picture showing Columbus's boat. That's one of the young You could fit 10 or 15 of Columbus's boats in just one of the young cargo. And let's look at their relative impact. Well, Zheng He made a good impression where he, where he went. He was actually deified in some parts of Southeast Asia. There's even some temples that still worship him as a divinity. And he created some embassies in China's capital from places as far afield as Japan, Malaya, Vietnam, or Egypt. And some of his geographical works got published. Um, and then the expeditions was closed down after 1433. Now, if you look at Columbus, we all know he became one of the most famous names in history. His discovery led to the conquest of the New World by Spain and Portugal with massive destruction of indigenous populations and culture. And, and it's really not too far-fetched to say that that was the beginning of the modern world order. So the riddle is, why did Columbus transform the entire world? Why not Zhang He? Well, historians have long looked at this and come up with what you might think of as proximate causes. Um, for example, in Zhang He's case, they look at a power struggle between court bureaucrats um, in China with the eunuchs and merchants who supported these voyages of exploration. Um, and there was greater emphasis on internal infrastructure projects such as canals, um, such as Chinese canal network. And then there were these incursions from the Mongols and Tatars in the north, so they had to improve their defenses. And there was also something called a hygiene or sea ban that lasted for a couple of hundred years through this period and was only temporarily suspended during Zhang He's time. So that by 1500, it was actually a capital offense to build a seagoing junk with more than two masks. Now, if we look over at Columbus, um, again, you can see some proximate causes. There was the economic goal in Europe at that time to find a sea passage to India. And in, in fact, it is a map, uh, the kind of map that Columbus used to get his financing, which um, actually saw uh, India as an island that was where Mexico really is, and imagine China just a little bit past California. <laughs> um, and then there was Columbus's personal ambition. He negotiated to be governor of all new lands and to get 10% of revenues in perpetuity. And importantly, there was a lot of political fragmentation in Europe. So Columbus first tried to get financing from Portugal, Italy, and even England before he finally got Ferdinand and Isabella out of Spain to money up the funds. But these really just look at the superficial causes for the difference <laughs> between the two. So in this presentation, we're going to look at some of the underlying causes, and specifically, some of the underlying cognitive causes. And we're going to kind of rephrase the riddle um, in this way, to ask what in the Europeans' cognitive structure was them to think about naval exploration in terms of conquest and domination. Well, Young, with his vastly superior technology, nearly sought prestige for the Chinese emperor along with trading and diplomatic connections. So to get at this, we're going to have to look at the different worldviews of both civilizations. And we'll look at how those worldviews led to two different sets of values 
and how those values led to two different approaches to power between them. And we'll start off by looking at traditional Chinese cognition. But I do want to point out <coughs> that um, as we're looking at this, we're looking at the traditional Chinese cognition, which has only um, uh, some small elements to do with the kind of Chinese cognition that we see right now in the modern world um, as we see China take the role it's, um, it's taking. So, <coughs> beginning with the traditional Chinese worldview, they understood the universe as comprising waves of qi or energy, which undulated through this uh, kind of up and down of yin and yang. They saw there being no fixed laws of nature, only underlying patterns. And they saw everything as being connected within a network of heaven, earth, and humanity. And humans, they understood as being an integral part of the natural world. Now, this worldview has certain implications. <clears throat> so that um, they saw the forces of yin and yang in everywhere around them rising and falling, and no universal fixed truth, only the way that they called the Tao. They understood everything only within its particular context. And they even saw their own individual identity as rising from their place within the community. So this led to a set of traditional Chinese values, which was that the ultimate goal of life was really to find harmony within the cosmic network, to resonate and balance with the forces of yin and yang. And that harmony arises through integration of the different parts within an individual, or the in integration of the individual within society, or between humanity and the natural world. And to give you a sense of what this meant in contrast to European thought. There's a great quote from the exasperation of a Jesuit missionary trying to get the Chinese to mine the precious metals. And he wrote this frustrated letter home. The Chinese say the mountains are full of gold and silver, but that the working on them has been hindered from some political views that the public tranquility might not be disturbed by the too great abundance of these metals, which would make the people haughty and negligent of agriculture. So that <clears throat> traditional view led to this um, Chinese view of power. And um, they had a concept of the mandate of heaven, that ancestral spirits would endorse the emperor only if he ruled responsibly. They saw a social and political hierarchy modeled on the traditional family structure. And in fact, they saw the rights and responsibilities of power inextricably linked. So they even had the same word for care for and govern. And in the words of the great historian of China, Joseph Needham, their society showed this self-regulating homeostasis. Now, it's important to also realize that um, even with this view, there were still all kinds of Chinese dynastic conflicts and wars that took place all the time. But it was within this context they had that whatever they were doing was with the object of re-establishing the harmony that had, that had been there before. And to give you a sense of what this meant in real life, I'll tell you a little story about Zheng He and a giraffe. Um, when he got to Bengal, the emperor of Bengal gifted a giraffe to Zheng He that he took back uh, to, to, to China and told him it was called the Jirin, which was what it was called um, in, the, in East Africa, where they originally got the giraffe from. Well, when the Chinese received this, they were thrilled, because the, the name Jirin sounded just like Chilin, which was the name for a mythical creature that looked like that, that they figured must be the giraffe. And that was a very good omen for them. It proved the virtue of the emperor and demonstrated heaven's favor. So the next time Zheng He went on one of his journeys, it was all the way down to East Africa, to, the, um, to Malindi. And when he got there, he established diplomatic relationships with the chieftains there, got to show them the, the, the wonders of his nobility, so that they would then gift in tribute more giraffes that he could then bring back to China. Now, let's turn to European cognition. Well, the European worldview was that there's an omnipotent God out there who created the universe with a fixed set of laws of nature. That God gave man dominion over the natural world. 
And Christianity was the universal religion of humanity. And, and by following Christian precepts, one's immortal soul would then get to reside eternally in heaven. So that worldview <coughs> led to this European set of values. God transcending the world is the ultimate source of those values. And exploiting the natural world is actually fulfilling God's command. Individuality with that immortal soul is more important than your mere identity within your community. And non-Christians are really just heretics without rights to be converted if possible. So that led to a European view of power, that it was a valid use of technology to alter the balance in society, that nature was an object to be conquered. Or in the words of that great historian of science, Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. And to give you a, a sense of that, let's look at a story about Columbus when he first arrived, when he made landfall in the Caribbean for the first time. And he got to know this um, innocent tribe there called the Arawak. And he wrote in his journal, of anything they have, if you ask them for it, they never say no. Um, rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. Then the journal continues on a little more darkly. They would make fine servants. Should your majesty's command it, all the inhabitants could be taken away to Castile or made slaves on the island. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. So we have two different approaches to power. The Chinese, uh, the traditional Chinese was more to integrate and bureaucratize, whereas the European was more to dominate and exploit. Now, the, um, the historian of China, Joseph Needham, has explored how those different views have had profound effects on the trajectories of those two civilizations, in particular in, in the way that they responded to innovations in technology. And he gives a couple of examples I'll take you through quickly. One is the story of stirrups, which were first used in India, in Sanchi, India, in the 2nd century BCE. They got to Imperial China by the 4th century CE, and they really had no measurable impact on society. A few hundred years later, in the 8th century, stirrups got to the continent of Europe where they transformed it. And here's how. And um, cavalrymen in battle used stirrups to weld themselves to their horse. They, they could then deliver a penetrating blow with a sword or lance. And then the mounted knight became the supreme warrior of Europe, leading to the traditions of chivalry and feudalism that really characterized medieval Europe. And let's look at the story of gunpowder. Taoist alchemists discovered that in China in the 9th century CE. Um, and they recognized that they could use that in warfare. Um, but it just supplemented what had been in use before. In the words of Needham, it had no perceptible effect upon the age-old civil and military bureaucratic apparatus. Now, when gunpowder gets to Europe in the 14th century CE, again, it transforms the system, this time by demolishing the feudal system, the fortified castle that had been the center of power of the European feudal aristocracy suddenly becomes vulnerable to the bombardment of cannons. And that really marks the beginning of the end of the feudal structure of Europe. So what we see in both of those stories is this propensity of the European mind to look for ways to use innovative technologies to change the rules of the game and thus gain a power advantage over others. Or you could say, to summarize, that might is right. And it's not really about this Europe versus China, but much more about a unique European cognition relative to the rest of the world. And to get a sense of that, just take you briefly through the story of self-Asian trading practices back in the early 16th century. And there had been these multilateral trade routes, merchants play for centuries from China, Southeast Asia, India, Arabia, and Africa. And there were unwritten rules peaceful coexistence. There was respect for each other's ships. Um, everyone would carry goods and passengers for each other. Meanwhile, um, in 1500, just eight years after Columbus discovered America, um, 
Pedro Cabral, the Portuguese, comes to South India, attacks two Muslim ships in Calcutta. Violence erupts on both sides. And before too long, the Portuguese had forced all of the other sides to sign treaties, allowing them to buy products at the low market prices. They were required special Portuguese permits for ocean trade, which were violently enforced. In the words of historian Janet Abu Lugar, more than anything else then, it was the new European approach to trade come plunder that caused a basic transformation in the world system that had developed and persisted over some five centuries. And in fact, you can even go further back in history um, to India's influence over all of Southeast Asia. It was so influential that it's been called by some historians Greater India, as though India had their own empire. Um, but that empire, <clears throat> was a totally peaceful one. In the words of historian John Kay, um, trade, religious institutions, and loyal authority operated in consort to promote security, extend agrarian settlement, and stimulate state formation. Meanwhile, back in Europe, um, as the years went on, Europeans established this hegemony over the entire world, so that by the end of the 19th century, that little country, Great Britain, ruled over 500 million subjects, over 90% of Africa was ruled by Europeans. And the cognitive structure that dominated that was best summarized by the British imperialist Cecil Rhodes, who once said, we must find new lands from which we can easily obtain raw materials and at the same time exploit the cheap slave labor available from the natives of the, of the colonies. And he goes on, the colonies would also provide a dumping ground surplus goods produced in our factories. So over the last hundred or two years, of course, the world has fulfilled exactly that vision of Cecil Rhodes, and including, as we see nowadays in China as well as everywhere else in the world, we see population exploding along with per capita GDP, as well as some other side effects of that causing an unsustainable relationship between um, humanity and the natural world, which leads us back to that riddle. We asked to begin with, why did Columbus transform the entire world? Why not John Carr? And hopefully what we've seen in this presentation is that these underlying causes were cognitive, that it would have been just as unthinkable for Admiral John to have conquered and enslaved the societies he visited with his armada, as it was unthinkable for Columbus to have traded with the indigenous people of the New World and brought emissaries back to Spain as ambassadors. So I'd just like to leave you with something to contemplate about all this. If, if today's cognition becomes tomorrow's history, well then how does our thinking today construct the legacy we leave to the future? So thanks. So um, this, this um, presentation is actually a chapter from uh, my book in process called The Patterning Instinct of Cognitive History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. And if anybody would like to get a PDF of this chapter, um, please feel free to email me at jeremylentgmail.com and I'd be happy to send them to you. So thank you very much. Thank you.